to with the next session because we want to ask Margot Constantine, partner Dubai and McKinsey's public and social sector practice to shed some light on how a year of no travel, no global travel, will impact local economies in the long run. So Margot, how are you in Dubai? Is Margot coming in from Dubai? I guess it's a long way. Hello, Margot. How lovely to see you. Okay, and I can hear Margot. Super. Oh, okay, finally. This is the time of COVID, right? Where we keep saying, can I hear you? I can't hear you. <laughs> so Margot, how are you? Very good. Great to see everyone. Fantastic. Okay. So, you know, the good news for the industry is that the World Travel and Tourism Council uh, just wrapped up their physical event in Cancun this week, more than 600 uh, physical delegates. And it reported that in 2020, the global travel and tourism sector lost almost $4.5 trillion and more than 62 million jobs lost. It's, it's a tragedy. So let's share a chart from a McKinsey study where you, you did this study in October 2020, uh, and you've now revised the number of 8.1 to 7.7. 7. Um, and are you sticking to recovery by 2024? Yeah. Yeah, well, as a mix of uh, leisure and, uh, and, and business, and a mix of domestic and outbound. Right. And you re why did you revise that figure from 8.1 to 7.7? 7? Yeah, so I think um, a couple of things happened. So originally in October, we did this effort on the basis of the top 10 largest source markets globally, uh, and extra which make up about 70% of global spends. Um, and then we, we expanded it to uh, 40 source markets, which make up 90% of global spend. And so the extrapolation was a slightly bit more optimistic, taking a broader set of countries as okay. opposed to a more narrow set of countries, because places like Italy and Spain were massively driving down the average compared to other places in the world. Yeah. Now, you know, that said, I think the biggest thing in the forecast is when we did them originally, which was the first draft we did actually a full year ago. And uh, everyone felt that our 2020 estimates were, 2021 estimates were very negative and conservative. So uh, there was about a 30% uplift compared to 2020 and 2021. And people felt that was very, very pessimistic. And, and you know, I think by now I'm starting to feel that maybe our 2021 outlook is actually, unfortunately, a little bit on the optimistic side. Yeah, it does. So, uh, we'll whatever, be... the, the numbers just look so massive, right? You know. So let's, let's go to what is the no-brainer we've heard today a lot about, about local tourism, right? It's definitely expected to recover faster than outbound travel. Um, so can you name three other markets in APAC you know, and Middle East where you have seen some healthy domestic recovery? So in, we've definitely seen recovery in China, Taiwan, and in Hong Kong and Singapore too, where a domestic market has been created out of practically nothing. Yeah, I think if we look at, at Middle East and APAC, there are some interesting um, movements for selected countries. So I'm obviously based in Dubai right now. Uh, and so the situation in the UAE is interesting because it's a, it's a quite small domestic market. Uh, it's a small country. Uh, and it, it was very much reliant on, on international inbound. And they've done quite a decent job at trying to capitalize on local demand. Uh, especially via hotel deals and promotions that combine hotel with retail uh, and with F&B and sort of whole, whole lifestyle experience type of package that goes beyond the hotel room, um, which has kept the hotels afloat and things like rent the room for the day as opposed to for the night. Yeah, and so these types of things of are things. similar things happening in Singapore and Hong Kong as well. You know, exactly. Very, very similar. Okay, so let's that have to... a smoke. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, so the, the, the discussion is around like whatever uptick in domestic travel, it cannot make up for the shortfall in inbound tourism, right? So if we take the example of Vietnam where you did a study and we're going to show this chart, which basically shows that, you know, international travelers made up 17% of overall tourists, but accounted for more than half of tourism spending, right? So mm -hmm. you have an international traveler that would spend 673 versus $61 for a domestic traveler. At the same time, you have Vietnamese tourists that were traveling and they spent, you know, 15.5 billion, right? And then 6 billion float overseas. So what do you think is the long-term uh, economic impact on tourism, inbound tourism dependent countries like Vietnam? Yeah, look, I think for, for countries that have, uh, that are more middle class and emerging, the domestic substitution is just really tougher, right? So in China, that has worked beautifully well. You have the largest outbound market that is now locked in your country. Obviously, for places that are a little bit more emerging, middle class, um, the, the substitution can be harder. Um, and, and, and there is no replacement for it. And so I think what, what we see, um, uh, uh, what, what needs to happen is, A, for sure, try to convert this outbound tourism into domestic tourism. Saudi Arabia has been working aggressively on this over the last year, uh, uh, and that's a no-brainer, right? That gets you already half, half, half there or so, so, so that's important. Uh, uh, and then I think there's everything around exploring completely new and different segments. So digital nomads, long-term stays, converting properties to um, uh, either partially real estate or partially uh, 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 work office and workplaces. A core has converted entire hotels into places you can book for for meeting rooms and and to work as an office for the day. Um, so being a little bit more creative in how we think about segments, just going beyond yeah. domestic and international. I mean, it's just like um, this, it's just like in this studio here. You know, this used to be a VIP uh, lounge and now it's turned into a, a hybrid studio. So let's go to your chart, the next chart where you predict that. Vietnam could recover by 2024 uh, if it controls infection rates. And then basically you kind of shared six steps uh, that you felt that Vietnam and other destinations uh, with infection rates under control should take on the road to recovery, right? So you pick, you, you, you named the six steps. Pick one that you feel most passionate about. So look, as I do a lot of work with the government, I feel very passionate about reimagining government control in tourism. I think the governance of the sector is a little bit archaic in most places. You have a Ministry of Tourism that doesn't really control any of the tourism levers um, or the tourism authority and the coordination between public and private actors tends to be a little bit haphazard. I think what we've been thinking about is how do you make all of this much more agile and much more participatory between both public and private sector. So how do you have joint decision making between a Ministry of Tourism, a Ministry of Health, who right now is very important, a Ministry of Transport that controls the airport um, and how you involve the airline, some of the big hotel chains, et cetera, and all of the decisions that you make, as opposed to sort of siloed decisions that then receive feedback from private sector, get revisited six months later and so on and so forth. An example of this is all of these big subsidies, support package programs that have been launched globally. Um, what you see is big, big, big numbers, lots of good intentions, but the money that actually goes out is not that big because those packages are actually not really designed always to meet the needs, the real needs of the private players. And if they had been involved in co-creating this with government, you might have found a way of doing this much, much more efficiently. Yeah, and especially, I mean, absolutely critical at this period is, you know, the government collaboration with the industry in terms of opening borders, right? Because the governments are now controlling uh, that aspect, whether, you know, the industry can come out with 25 travel passports, but they ain't going to work if the governments do not come on board. Look, and what we've seen globally consistently is Ministry of Health is making a certain announcement. The next day, the airports announces something different in terms of reopening dates and their airline something completely different. And as soon as you have that confusion in the communication and what's open and what's closed, you see within 24 hours changes in bookings. So flight cancellations, hotel booking cancellations. It's very, very sensitive market to uh, lack of coherence in government announcements.
So in, you have a lot of conversations with governments, as you say, right? You know, is there anything about the conversations that you're having now that gives you hope in terms of working with the industry to open borders? What gives you hope? Um, look, I think governments have never realized as much as right now the importance of the sector for their economy. And so it's become a very big priority. Many countries don't have anything that would classify as a Ministry of Tourism, actually, right? Including in Europe, forget even Asia. So most European countries that have a Ministry of Tourism, no national federal body to drive this agenda. And so I think there's this realization of how important this is, how precarious the situation of the workforce that works in these sectors are, which hopefully will drive faster actions from government. You've seen it in parts of, I mean, you know, the German government took a 25% convertible loan into TUI in Germany. That is quite, you know, they're used to, we're used to governments rescuing airlines. We're a lot less used to governments rescuing DMCs and two operators. So, um, uh, or, or hospitality players could come next. Okay, so thank you, Margot, and good luck with your conversations with governments, and let's try and get borders open. Thank you, Margot, for dialing in from Dubai. <laughs> Thank you.